Hello guys, it's Shit Can Plays, I'm Fabio Pisco and welcome to my channel. And for today's video we have kind of a Salvation Army episode where I give you 20 tips on how to fix AMD's problems. And I'm saying AMD's pro problems in quotes because these are problems that most people on the AMD side complain about, but most of them, and I repeat most of them, are not only happening to the AMD users. So most of the tips that you're gonna see in this video work for AMD, Intel and Nvidia as well. Not all of course, but the vast majority of them do. So if you have an NVIDIA card, this video applies to you as well. And I know that there, there will be some people in the comment section telling Well, but the best way to get rid of AMD's problems is to buy an NVIDIA GPU. <laughs> no. Seriously, big no. I have both NVIDIA and AMD GPUs, even Intel ones, and all of them have their own issues. Different issues most of the times, but they do have their own issues. It might happen that you, select, that you go from an, an AMD GPU to an NVIDIA GPU and you stop having issues because you don't know, you don't really know how to fiddle with AMD GPUs because AMD drivers do, do indeed tend to, to be a bit more picky with software incompatibilities and so on. And it might happen the opposite because it happened a lot of times with people having issues on the Nvidia side and going to the AMD side and having exactly none. And just before going, I just want to tell you that all the knowledge that is here is knowledge that I've been gathering across the years of having this channel. They are gathered from problems that I had, from problems that the community had, and from problems that I've seen online or that I had across the years in different systems in different times. So this is what can actually help you and that's why I'm making this video. But well, let's go for the first tip. Clean driver installation. Yeah, what is clean driver installation? Should you get kind of cloth and clean the drivers instead before installing them? Of course not, that would be stupid. Clean driver installation is basically what you should do for every driver installation, having you an AMD, Nvidia or Intel GPU. You should always do a clean installation if you want to avoid issues. Doing an overriding of your previous drivers won't mean that you will automatically or immediately have issues, but it means that you might have them. For example, if you update now via the software, you update after that and after that and after that and after that. After some time, you might have issues due to that because you're having lots and lots of driver installations on top of each other. Let's imagine that you're running, for example, the 23.5.2 or let's say 23.7.1. That's the driver that, that is actually working for you or you just never remember to update and you then go automatically from the 23.7.1 to the 24.2.1. And that since you are coming from a really, really old version and you are kind of overwriting that same older version with a way newer version, that can cause issues as well. So what you have to do is basically do a clean installation and for that you can use DDU, Display Driver Installer. You actually have this video passing right now on the screen where I explain you how to properly install the drivers, in this case, clean install the drivers. So you can go to that video with link in the description, okay, it will be there. And I show you everything you need to know about clean installing drivers in that same video. Clean installing the drivers using DDU or the MD Cleanup Utility will fix most issues that most users have. And just before going to the next tip, let's hear a word from our sponsor. Today's video sponsor is GVG Mo, bringing you lots of software deals like Windows 10, Windows 11, Office 2019 or 2021 with a new Windows 11 design. And for all of these, you can use my SKG discount code for 30% off, getting a Windows 11 serial key for $22 and a Windows 10 one for only $15. Then use the key on your Windows settings and you'll have an activated system. The second tip is chipset drivers. Chipset drivers, if you don't know what chipset drivers are, they are your motherboard drivers. So for example, if you have an AMD CPU with a, with let's say an, a B650, an X670, let's say an X570 or a, a B550, for example, those are your chipset, your motherboard chipsets. And not having the chipset drivers might actually lead to lots of issues. I've seen that across the years as well. One issue that it might lead to, for example, is black screens. And you might ask, well, but why am I having black screens? This computer is new, this GPU is new, 
and I'm having black screens because the chipset drivers also fiddle with the GPU as well, especially if you have an AMD CPU plus AMD GPU combo. In that scenario, chipset drivers are a must because they will definitely fix most of your issues once again, like black screens, like for example, let's say monitor flickering, uh, free sync not, not working properly, for example, having tearing while still inside the free sync's range, chipset drivers will fix them. So what you have to do is go to AMD side if you're using an AMD motherboard and in the same page that you download the AMD drivers, go and select the chipset drivers, select the chipset you're using once again, B550, X670E, doesn't really matter. Just pick the one you're using, download the chipset drivers and install them. The most important things are clean installing your drivers and after that, installing the chipset drivers. If you have an Intel CPU, you can download their chipset drivers on your motherboard's website or on the Intel site as well. Updating your motherboard BIOS is also a very important thing and most people kind of neglect it. If you have really recent parts, you need and you should be updating your motherboard BIOS, especially if you're having issues because, for example, motherboard BIOS might bring new Ajaza, basically new microcode and firmware code to the motherboard and to the CPU, making, for example, your memory compatibility be better. That happened some time ago with, um, with the M5 platform, with the Ryzen 7000 series CPUs, where the CPUs were having issues reaching above 6000 megahertz usually they would cap at let's say 6400 megahertz and after those bios updates they were able to achieve let's say like 8000 9000 megahertz which is quite insane of course you have to decouple the uclk but that's a different story basically the same as the gear on the intel side but they they happen to work that way and before they didn't it might actually get you better performance and better stability so if you're having issues updating your motherboard bios is definitely the way to go it isn't as hard as most of you think but if you want to check it out link will be in the description as well The fourth tip is actually for the AMD side only and is install Amer Nimi Moda drivers, now Radeon ID drivers, or the Radeon Pro drivers. And you might ask why install the, the Pro drivers, why install them or why install Moda drivers when I, when I have the adrenaline ones? Well, I can tell you right away that for the recent GPUs, for the recent GPUs, let's say 6000 and 7000 series at least, installing the, the Pro drivers might lead to a better stability. Some people might have issues with some uh, with some cards in some scenarios, some really odd issues, and the Pro drivers might fix them. We have way less, way less versions of the Pro drivers compared to the Adrenaline ones because they need to test them way, way more in order to ensure the stability as the Pro drivers are aimed once again at professional workloads. And people kind of living out of professional workloads, they can't have stutters, they can't have crashes, they have, they need to have the computer working perfectly 100% of the time because they make money out of it, they make their living out of it. So that's why the Pro drivers are way more tested and in some scenarios might fix some of the issues that you're having. And by the way, I made a video testing the Pro drivers versus the Adrenaline drivers in gaming scenarios uh, because stability wise they were more or less the same for me although some people say they have better performance with uh with the pro drivers compared to the adrenaline ones i don't really know how exactly but they say they do so great for them but now going back to the topic in terms of the video you can see the gaming performance of the adrenaline versus the pro drivers in two different cards that i tested so if you want once again if you want to watch that video check the link in the description because it will be there as for the older GPUs, the Radeon ID drivers, the modded ones, kind of have their own perks. For example, with cards like the RX 580, the Vega 56, uh, 8 gigabytes, and some older cards, you can actually enable smart access memory that will deliver a slight performance boost in some titles like Forza Horizon 5, The Last of Us, and so on. If you're running those older GPUs, the Radeon ID drivers will actually allow you to enable that feature, even if it isn't officially supported, leading to an overall better performance on your system. Uh, uh, amongst that, you, we have once again the DX11 optimizations, for example, uh, that only came to the 5000 series, basically RDNA GPUs, 5000 series and above. And those same DX11 optimizations will also help in terms of CPU bottleneck scenarios. Let's imagine you're running, for example, a Vega 56 once again, uh, which is more or less on par with the RX 5600 XT. And you're running that card in a really big CPU bottleneck scenario. Let's say, for example, you have an old i5, or let's say you 
have a Ryzen 1000 series processor and in those scenarios you're you're running into a really big CPU bottleneck. You're playing let's say eSports games, eSports games and that's the reason why you're still using your Vega, let's say that. The Radeon ID drivers, the modded ones once again, might actually help you in that scenario. They might unlock smart access memory for you they might unlock the DX11 optimizations and they might unlock some other features that aren't presented officially for those older GPUs. If you have an older GPU, the modded drivers might actually come handy and might actually deliver great performance. And if you want to see how they work or how to install them, you can go to my video section because I have lots of videos on them, testing the modded drivers from the older to the newer versions and showing you how to install them as well. So all you have to do is go to the video section and you'll have everything you need there. The fifth one is install driver only. And this applies to the NVIDIA side and to the AMD side as well. If you're having lots of issues, well, it might actually happen that the issue is not the driver itself, but instead the software kit, in this case, the adrenaline kit, or for example, the control panel from NVIDIA, or even the GeForce experience from NVIDIA. So instead of the driver itself, might be the software kit that is showing the issues, or maybe uh, that is incompatible with some software that you have installed. Usually the performance difference or maybe the stability difference shouldn't even be different. But in some scenarios, because computers are like this, uh, we have lots of scenarios, actually lots, way more than they should be, but lots of scenarios where we can't really explain what's happening but we know it is happening uh, and this is one of those scenarios so just once again install the driver only I actually made these two videos some days ago the first one for the AMD side of the driver only versus minimal installation versus full installation in terms of performance and I did the same some days ago for the Nvidia side comparing the Nvidia app the new beta Nvidia app versus the driver only versus minimal installation versus full installation as well in terms of performance and actually we have we have some interesting results but nothing that should be actually changing the, the stability of your system or the performance of your system so if something's happening well yeah you can try this one might actually help you fix your issues disabling ULPS I believe it's called like ultra low power state or something like that and this is mostly not mostly I believe this is only for the MD cards so the ultra low power state modes for example when you're running into a really CPU bottleneck scenario the MD cards will kind of idle themselves in order to conserve power imagine if you're running a really fast GPU like the 7900 XTX or you're running a really light game like League of Legends when I'm running League of Legends with my 7900 XTX even with my 7700X which is a powerful CPU what happens happens is that since the game is really light on the GPU side I'll be I'll still be having like 500 or 600 FPS and still my GPU will be running at let's say 1500 megahertz or 1600 megahertz instead of the 3000 and once again that happens because it goes into the the low power state mode to save power because it doesn't need that much power to run League of Legends so it will kind of idle down but that thing, that same thing of the ultra low power saving states or the ultra low power states, that thing might actually lead to issues once again like black screens, stutters and some other issues that come uh, with those, with the lowering of those power states kind of getting low then up then low then up. So in order to fix those issues you can install MS Afterburner then go to the options of the MS Afterburner, go to the bottom of the tab and you have there disable ULPS and once again this will only appear for the MD cards disable ultra low power state or something like that and by disabling that clicking apply you don't need to have MS Afterburner opened all the time you just install MS Afterburner select that option and you can close MS Afterburner after that you can even reboot your computer it will be it will still be there and it this option alone disabling ULPS might fix lots lots of issues once again like black screens stutters even monitor flickering and so on if you're having those issues try this one out it's really really good fix and now we have VRAM temperatures most of you guys don't really think about that and that's normal the normal consumer doesn't need to to think about VRAM temperatures and doesn't even make sense but VRAM temperatures might actually be the cause of your uh, 
well, of your stutters and in most scenarios the cause of your low performance. I, for example, several years ago had a ROG Strix RX 470, which was one of the worst GPUs that I've ever had. And that same card would perform well, but after some time I would have issues with the GPU clock. Not the VRAM clock, listen to me, not the VRAM clock. The GPU clock. The GPU clock would go uh, as low as 300 MHz from time to time, so it would go like 1500 then 300 megahertz, then two seconds, 1500, then once again, 300 megahertz. And after several, several, several tests and kind of getting really, really mad with the GPU, I found out that as soon as I increased the fan level to the maximum, that issue would not happen. And even without the fan at maximum, I would have very good temperatures on core. So I went further and investigated the memory, the VRAM temperatures. And the VRAM temperatures were through the roof. So basically the core was clocking down in order to make things cooler, in order for the VRAM temperature to go down as well for some seconds, in order to be able to perform properly once again. So even though my GPU core clock was the one going down, the issue were the VRAM temperatures. And as soon as I raised the fan speed to the maximum, those VRAM temperatures would be inside what they should be and the performance would not be dropping every three seconds. Check your VRAM temperatures with WAG Info 64, you can see them there, just go down to the GPU, to the GPU part and you have the VRAM temperatures there, in case your GPU has the VRAM temperature sensor of course, and you can monitor that. This of course in case you're having the same issue that I was explaining here, so that might happen and I really hope this helps someone, yeah. Resetting your GPU. And this one might actually seem dumb, but <laughs> but believe me, it isn't. I've seen several cases, several case scenarios where, for example, people were complaining, were complaining that the GPU wasn't working properly. Uh, it, they were having black screens, they were having lots of things regarding the black screens mostly, and all they had to do was kind of take off the GPU, reset it once again, if possible, kind of clean the, the, um, the connectors of the GPU, the PCIe 16 connectors of the GPU, then go and put it on the motherboard again and make sure that you are actually um, sitting it properly, okay, tight, sit it tight, uh, and if you can, use a GPU holder in order to not have the GPU sag. People might actually not insert the GPU correctly on the motherboard, they might actually have dust on the PCIe connectors, it might be lots of things, but it might be dumb and it might seem dumb, but in some scenarios, all people had to do was actually take off the GPU, clean it and insert it properly once again and the problems were gone. So yeah, try this one as well. Lots of people don't really care about the cable connections that they are, that they are getting, especially in terms of cable quality. Do not cheap out on your cables, on your HDMI cables, or on your DisplayPort cables, do not cheap out, get a good cable. Because a good cable is a way to fix most of the issues that might come if you get a, a bad cable. Some cables might actually cause issues once again, like flickering, free sync not working properly, uh, the color depth not working properly, uh, having like green screens, blue screens and so on, that might happen, well not blue screens, but gray screens and green screens might happen due to having a poor cable. Get the best cable that you can get, let's say 16K, 60Hz or something like that, get the best HDMI or the best display port cable that you can get in order to avoid possible issues that those cheap cables can get. And also if you're still having issues with a good cable, I would advise you to try and change, for example, if you are using an HDMI connection to your monitor, try and change uh, into a DisplayPort 1. Or if you're using a DisplayPort 1, try and use an HDMI 1. I personally, for computers only nowadays, I use nothing but DisplayPort. I only use HDMI if I really have to, but usually I use DisplayPort for everything else and it works wonderfully. So all I can say is I advise you to use DisplayPort and please get a good cable. If you don't know, monitors also have software, which we call firmware, 
and sometimes in some specific models they might have issues from factory and you might need to later update your monitors firmware let's say that you have an LG monitor all you have to do is go to the LG to the LG website search for your monitor model go to the support page and see if you got any updates on your firmware and if they have an update for your firmware just make it just do it it might actually improve freezing quality it might actually improve freezing stability it might even improve the colors out of the box and it might improve improve things like HDR brightness and so on so if you have a firmware update for your monitor it might actually be the thing that you need in order to once again avoid black screens avoid intermittent black screens green screens gray screens and in sometimes sometimes monitor flickering when using variable refresh rate slash freezing slash gsync so once again this one is very important if you're having the issues that i stated go to your manufacturer's website download the firmware update if it is available and do it just update it because most times it might fix those issues FreeSync is one of those things that has been around for quite some time. When Nvidia invented G-Sync and actually took it to the market level, uh, AMD came with a free solution called FreeSync. And both technologies are technologies that basically apply the variable refresh rate technique. So the monitor will adjust its Earths its refresh rate according to the FPS numbers that your GPU is delivering. So imagine that you have a FreeSync monitor up to 160 Hz with let's say a range of from 48 to 160. If you're running a game at 80 FPS, the monitor refresh rate will go down to 80. If you're running the game at 90, the refresh rate will go to 90. If you're running the game at 120 FPS, the refresh rate will also go to 120 Hz to ensure that you have no tearing and you have a really, really smooth game. Play. While without FreeSync, of course, the monitor will just stay at its maximum refresh rate all the time, which in this case would be 160 Hz. And if you are not at 160 FPS, you'll have tearing and the gameplay will just feel stuttery. As soon as you enable FreeSync, G-Sync or VRR, doesn't really matter, you will get a way, way smoother experience. Because sometimes the stuttery experience might not be on the GPU side and you might actually be playing the game and you might feel that the game is stuttery, but it isn't the game and it isn't your computer that is stuttering. You're just having tearing and you're having that stuttery feeling because the GPU and monitor are not running at the same FPS slash Hertz. Just enable FreeSync and it will be way, way smoother, believe me. And Raiden anti lag is kind of a give and take, because in some scenarios it might actually improve your performance, it might improve your smoothness, and in some others it might actually ruin it. For example, I was playing Crisis Remastered, and in Crisis Remastered, as soon as I enabled ray tracing on my AMD card, I would have lots and lots of stutters, the gameplay just wouldn't feel smooth. But as soon as I enabled Raiden anti lag, the gameplay was silky smooth, and it just felt much better because since the frame timeline was much flatter, the monitor heard would also sync way better and the overall smoothness of the gameplay was definitely improved. Completely different experience from what I had before. But in some other scenarios, Raiden Anti-Lag act might actually be the cause of your stutters. I have it disabled by default and I only enable it in some specific scenarios where I know that I can actually benefit from it. Otherwise, leave Raiden Anti-Lag off and then enable it in some scenarios after experiencing those scenarios where you can actually get a better performance or a better gameplay experience from it like I'm telling you right now with Crisis Remastered when using ray tracing so you can actually enable Raiden Anti-Lag per game in those games where it can actually benefit enable for those games only now this one is one of the most important ones and it is overclocking stability and believe me i get so so mad so mad and so frustrated in some scenarios 100 percent sure that i've been that i that i saw over 2000 people over the years with this same exact issue and i myself was one of those oh i'm having driver issues my computer is is crashing my computer is actually restarting itself my computer is having black screens most times those issues are not related to the drivers and most times they have to do with overclocking stability and you might even say well but i don't overclock yes you do yes you do as soon as you go to your bios and you press that little button called 
XMP you are overclocking. For example, if you have DDR5, as soon as you go over 4800 MHz, you are overclocking. On DDR4, if you are going over 2133 or 2400 MHz, you are overclocking. So in some scenarios, XMP might not be stable, 100% stable, and the same happens with AMD Expo. Those profiles might not be 100% stable, and I've seen that hundreds of times, if not thousands of times as well. And I myself in the past had an issue with drivers. Well, I thought it was the drivers, but it wasn't. It was just overclocking instability on the RAM. As soon as I ramped up that voltage, well, everything was silky smooth, no more blue screens, no more, no more black screens, nothing. First of all, if you're having those issues, I advise you to go and put everything to default. If everything works properly with stock settings, then the issue was with overclocking. And believe me, RAM is one, usually is the culprit of everything or almost everything, RAM and CPU side. And once again, you might say, well, but with my older GPU, it didn't happen. And I can tell it right away that it didn't happen because most likely your older GPU was much slower than the new one. Let's say that you had, for example, a GTX 1060 and now you upgrade to a GTX, or in this case an RTX, an RTX 4060. The RTX 4060 is much faster than the GTX 1060. Since with the GTX 1060 you were having a lower amount of FPS, the CPU and the RAM weren't stressed enough in order to show that overclocking instability. But as soon as you go to a stronger GPU, that same GPU will push the CPU and RAM way more. It will stress them both way more. And that is where the instability will appear. So in most scenarios, you overclock your GPU and you think the issues are related to the GPU, but no, the issues are just related to an overclocking that you had before. You thought it was stable, but it just wasn't. And now that you have a stronger GPU, well, the overclocking instability just shows itself. And if you still want to overclock, for example, you can use Test Memory 5 to test your RAM stability, Prime 95 for the CPU. And by the way, I kind of forgot stating that, of course, if you still want to keep your memory overclocked, you can simply raise the memory voltage a bit more. Because, in, for example, in most DDR4 systems, the memory comes at 1.35. All you have to do is go to your BIOS and increase, for example, to 138. And the same applies to the DDR5, that you can simply go to BIOS and apply, let's say, 138, 138. 139 sorry and in most scenarios the XMP or the Expo profiles will then be stable so basically that's one of the things that you have to do but overall yeah that's it test everything at stock first once again and if you want you can use TM5 for RAM and Prime95 for the CPU side Virtualization serves mostly the purpose of for example emulating games basically using emulators or doing things like virtual boxes where you can get Windows inside Windows or you can install Linux in a virtual box or Mac in a virtual box. That's basically what it serves for. That's the purpose of virtualization. One thing that I advise you to do, if you really need virtualization enabled on BIOS, if you don't, just disable it. But if you do need virtualization, I actually advise you to go to your Windows settings and search for core isolation and disable the core isolation option. In terms of security, I believe that you won't have any issues with security and the core isolation might actually lead to a performance loss and I tested it in this video that you're seeing right now in the screen where in games like Spider-Man Remastered the performance that was lost was quite big disabling core isolation will lead usually to better performance and especially way smoother without any kind of stutters power supply who doesn't have one well usually some people actually actually have time bombs instead of power supplies. They think they have a power supply, but in most scenarios they have a time bomb just waiting to explode the rest of the computer. Whoa! So, whoa, right, that's the caps going then. Never cheap out on a power supply. Never. The power supply is one of the most, if not the most important thing on your computer. A good power supply will last you for, let's say, 10 years. I myself have a power supply that, that's, that has been working for like 12 years. And it is still, it has been working till like three or four days ago. I mean, it's still working, it's just not on the computer because I changed the power supply. But it has been working for 13 years and it was still rock solid. No black screens, no problems, nothing. Just flawlessly working because it was a good power supply. When you usually cheap out on the power supply side, what happens is that you'll get bigger numbers, let's say for example cheaper power supplies that have 
750 watts, uh, 800 watts, and so on. Most of those watts that they proclaim to achieve, they don't achieve them. I've seen that before, and my uncle actually tested that before. He had kind of some power supplies before, some years ago, that were 600 watts, and they wouldn't even reach 400 watts under heavy load. While really good power supplies, for example, like mine, 750 watts, and it can sometimes, under really, really heavy load, it can go over the 750 watts mark. So that's why you need a very good power supply. And that also has to do with, for example, the power rails. The power rails are very important, and the better the, the power supply, the better quality the power rails will have. So in terms of, let's say, uh, GPU power peaks, for example, because your GPU is running at, let's say, 400 watts. But from time to time, you might actually have a peak, perform a peak performance. You might actually have a peak power draw. So fr in, in kind of a fraction of second, it goes from 400 watts to, let's say, 600. And then it goes back to 400. Then once again, 600, then 500. And the better your power supply is, the, the less relevant those peaks will be the, because the power supply will handle them very well. My advice for anyone that isn't really, really on a tight budget is to go and select a minimum of 750 watts gold. It might actually hurt your wallet a bit in the beginning, but a good power supply like this one will go over a decade working flawlessly, especially if you're getting one for, let's, from, let's say, Corsair, Seasonic, Cooler Master, and there are way more brands with very good power supplies. If you have one of those, they will most likely work for several years without a single issue. And they won't bother you, they will give your system better stability and after some time, they will kind of get paid off because you will be sure that you won't have issues regarding the power supply. If on a budget, maybe uh, a power supply from a well-known brand as well, like Seasonic, Corsair, blah, 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 let's say 650 watts bronze. And this one shouldn't even need to be a tip anymore, but you'd be surprised with the amount of people that, that are still gaming on HDDs. I was surprised at least. In 2024, there are some people that are still playing on HDDs. Why? <laughs> and for nowadays games, playing on an HDD is murder. You're murdering your game experience. I made this video some time ago where I was actually testing HDD versus SSD experience and even my HDD that was really really fast, I had a 2TB one or a 4TB one that was and is really fast for a, for a normal HDD, let's say that, even in those scenarios I would have lots and lots of stutters in games like Horizon Zero Dawn for example, games that need to, to load lots of data, I would have stutters or I would have texture streaming, which was very annoying because it would kind of kill my gameplay experience. But as soon as I put the game on an SSD, it doesn't even need to be an NVMe, even a SATA SSD would be completely smooth. Well, of course, with the HDD, we would have stutters when loading new areas. The game would run fine, but as soon as we went into a new area and, um, and the computer needed to load lots of things, lots of textures from the HDD, it would stutter because the, the HDD wouldn't be able to feed enough data at enough speed for the rest of the system, so it would stutter, while the SSD or the NVMe would work perfectly. If you're playing games and you want your gameplay to be smooth, just get an SSD or an NVMe, because fairly, they're pretty cheap nowadays, so just get them, just get one of those, seriously. <laughs> MPO is multiplane overlay and it is a Windows thing. And how exactly disabling multiplane overlay can help? Well, it can help in terms of flickering, it can help in terms of green screens, gray screens, and even black screens, or intermittent black screens. In some cases, it does help a lot in some scenarios, and it is not your GPU that is the problem, Windows is the problem. As soon as you disable MPO, you don't have any more stutters, you don't have green screens, you don't have flickering, which is really, really annoying. Your FreeSync is working better, so disabling MPO by itself can actually help a lot in, the, in a lot of scenarios. And you can watch this video that I released some months ago, where I actually explain how to fix the, the issue and how to disable MPO in a really, really fast way, fast and easy way. So once again, if you're having flickering, black screens, green screens and so on, disabling MPO might actually help way more than you think. And another addition to the tips compared to the previous video that I made, basically this is a remake, uh, is check your riser cables 
and extended power cables. Because what can happen in some scenarios is that, for example, when you're using a riser cable, the riser cable isn't able to feed enough data, so isn't really a quality riser cable. Most people that want to mount their GPUs vertically, let's say, they need to use riser cables in order to connect the GPU to the motherboard. If you're having black screens, if your computer is shutting down, um, if you have intermittent black screens, once again, in instead of just a black screen, the intermittent one, sometimes the riser cable might be the issue, so getting a better riser cable especially one that supports PCI Express 4, especially that one, it's it's actually way better to, to choose one of those for the current GPUs and a good branded one. You, you will need to pay more, of course, but, at, but that will ensure the stability of your system. And usually people that want to get their GPUs vertically mounted, they have more expensive builds and they can actually afford a way better cable. And the same applies for the power supply extenders. Some people actually buy the extensions, not the extenders, the extensions for the power supply cables in order to make the build look cooler. And if those extensions aren't delivering the power the, the way they were supposed to, what might happen is that, yeah, you'll have issues once again, because if they are failing to deliver the power the, the way they were supposed to, the power might not reach the GPU correctly. For example, the, um, the voltages, the NPRs and so on, the power might not reach the GPU correctly and the computer will fail. It will give you once again black screens and so on and so on and so on. So make sure to have good quality extensions for the power supply and good quality riser cables. Those might be your issue. And getting closer to the final line, I actually have um, a tip that is mostly aimed at older motherboards. If you have, let's say, older motherboards that are the first generation that supports, for example, PCI Express 4, if you have one of those, or if you're running older versions of BIOS, let's say that, what you can do is go to your BIOS if you're having issues like, once again, black screens, if you're having lots of stutters, if you're having green screens, if you're having your computer just shutting down out of the blue, well, in that scenario, you can go to your motherboard BIOS, go to the advanced options, go to the PCI options and force the PCI version to the PCI 3.0. In the first versions, in the first BIOS versions of the X570 that I bought, the Asus Trix, that one I used that same tip, basically forcing the PCI Express 3 version instead of the PCI Express 4, because it would not reduce the, the performance as the GPU had 16 lanes, so it would make no difference in terms of performance, but in terms of stability, it was much better by the time. After some time it got updated, so it doesn't really make sense now and it works perfectly now, but by that time, if you're running an older motherboard or if you're running an older BIOS version, well, going and forcing the PCI Express 3 version versus the PCI Express 4 instead of the PCI Express 4 might actually help in, in terms of system stability, so you might try this one as well. And now we're basically close to the final line of this big ass video, <laughs> really big compared to the previous one actually. And the last tip is a clean Windows installation. If everything else fails, a clean installation will usually, usually fix the issue because if it is not an overclocking stability issue, for example, if your computer is kind of restarting out of the blue, it is usually, it usually has to do with overclock, overclocking stability, most likely CPU and RAM sided. But if it isn't, all the issues that we had so far, if those all did not fix your issue, then a clean installation will most likely will because you might have some virus on your computer, you might have some software incompatibility, you might have, um, I mean, you might even have some data miners on your computer, farming your computer, uh, delivering lower performance. And even Windows, since it updates itself way more than it should, in my opinion, we should have service packs like we had before, where we would have those service packs with lots of updates and tested updates instead of having one update today, one update in a week, another update in two weeks. That for me and that from my experience breaks the Windows after some time, especially when they then release even bigger updates like the 23 half two or before that one the 22 half two those updates after some time of you not formatting your windows or doing a clean windows installation after some time the windows might be the issue and you'll have some odd issues for example my main computer is in need of a clean windows installation because well, one of my discs it doesn't detect the disk uh, in order to eject it <laughs> it just doesn't do it i put it on every single computer the eject f works then the windows updated the eject worked again the eject option worked again, then it updated again and it stopped working once again. So, I mean, it's clearly, 
clearly a Windows issue. And the final one is basically the final bonus one, let's say the final bonus one, is to disable hardware accelerated GPU scheduling. Hardware accelerated GPU scheduling was something introduced by Nvidia quite some time ago and was recently introduced by AMD on their 7000 series GPUs. And what it basically does is that it puts on the, on the hardware side some scheduling that was being done by Windows. So it, it stops using Windows to do that same scheduling and puts it on the hardware side, on the GPU side, in order to improve performance and latency. But in some scenarios, especially on the AMD side, since it is a really, really new implementation, it might actually give you some issues. So if you're having stutters once again and, and so on, you can just go to the Windows option, go go to the graphics option and disable, simply disable the hardware accelerated GPU scheduling and it might fix those issues that you're having. And well guys, finally that's all for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe and share this video and please leave your comment in the comment section because I really want to know what you found about these issues, what, which tip actually fixed your issue or didn't fix at all. Just leave them in the comment section because I really want to know. Thank you very much for watching, guys, and see you in the next video. Cheers.